in hysterical reaction to trying to actually follow the Constitution time, Vox over here notes that Clarence Thomas's opinion would bring back child labor because Clarence Thomas has problems with how the Commerce Clause of the Constitution is currently being applied, as I do as well, because it doesn't really flow from the constitutional text. The Constitution gives the federal government the power to regulate interstate commerce, which namely is trade between the states. And thanks to a case called Wickard versus Filburn, which we've discussed in great detail, this allows the federal government to reach into states and get to pretty much purely intrastate activity that law at least has some impact on interstate commerce, which you know is kind of all of it. So yeah, Clarence Thomas thinks that, you know, this doesn't make sense because it's not what the Constitution says. And Vox is over here like the apocalypse is nigh, which is just like actually reading the Constitution, which Vox apparently has a problem with. So let's read this and respond to the Vox stupid. On Thursday, the Supreme Court imposed limits on the Clean Water Act. The court's decision in Sackett versus EPA, which was unanimous by the Supreme Court 9-0, to zero, is likely to do serious harm to the government's ability to quell water pollution including major waterways. I, I mean, it, uh, no, it just prevents the EPA from saying that everything everywhere is under their jurisdiction because water goes everywhere. It prevents them from going onto people's private land and saying your private land is part of the waterways because your runoff will run into, go across the street and run into a ditch, which will run into a creek, which will run into a stream, which will run into a river, which will run into a lake. It, so, it, no, it will not really have major impact on the EPA's ability to regulate the waters of the United States, no. And even if it does, that's because of the way that Congress wrote the law. So the Supreme Court is just interpreting the law that Congress actually wrote. So is that a dire consequence? Maybe, but it's what the courts are supposed to do. Reading the stat, Reading the words on the page. Meanwhile, Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion that would severely limit the power to legislate. They might as well take several volumes of the U.S. Code and light them on fire, possibly because many of the codes, many of them are in violation of U.S. law because they are not supported by the Commerce Clause because the Commerce Clause gives the federal government the ability to re regulate interstate commerce. That is commerce between states, interstate, between states not within states. So yes, this might radically reduce the power of the federal government, but that's what the Constitution says. The words on the page, my friend. To be clear, the concurring opinion is not law. It merely reflects the views of the justices who sign on to it. And this particular opinion is unlikely to garner five, five votes to become law. But that doesn't change the fact that Thomas and Gorsuch is only one of nine justices, and their views tend to shape the ideas of lawyers and judges throughout the legal system. Also, by the way, not that Vox has necessarily been paying attention, but this is by no means the first time that Clarence Thomas has written things like this. Because Clarence Thomas has been decrying this, this part of the law for quite some time in quite a few opinions because he's been fairly consistent on this view. He believes that the Commerce Clause has been wildly misinterpreted. I don't know necessarily I would go as far as Justice Thomas was, but I do overall agree that the Commerce Clause has gone too far because it allows the federal government to reach into in activity that purely happens within a state and doesn't transverse state lines. We're not talking about tariffs between states. We're not talking about, you know, states trying to restrict trucks or trying to restrict ads or trying to restrict things. We're talking about wholly intrastate activity. The federal government's law does not apply to this. The Tenth Amendment says, all powers not given to the federal government are reserved to the states and the people. So the Commerce Clause, which gives the federal government power to regulate the trade between the states, does not go to purely interstate. And the Constitution says that's for the states. That's just what the Constitution says. It's the words on the page, ma'am. Under the approach Thomas lays out, the federal ban on child labor might be unconstitutional. Maybe in some situations, possibly, because there might be businesses that are purely interstate. So would the minimum wage, federal laws protecting the right to unionize, bans on workplace discrimination, nearly all other regulation. As it relates to businesses that are purely interstate, maybe. You know, as to the larger companies that transverse state lines, you know, probably not so much. So 
probably would not interpatch, you know, large chains that are in between states. But as for businesses that are wholly interstate, yeah, it might very well do because that's the limits of Congress's power. Thomas's approach would endanger countless gun laws. Well, not for nothing, but also the Second Amendment, by the way. So also interstate commerce, but also the Second Amendment when it comes to the guns. Rules requiring health insurers to provide people with pre-existing discussions, conditions, to bans on white-only lunch counters. As a matter of federal law, quite possibly. As it relates to some of the businesses, as it relates to some businesses which transfer state lines, perhaps not. So as it relates to large companies that have multiple different businesses in multiple different states, yeah. Would this go to health insurance? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, it wouldn't impact wholly within state businesses because the Constitution doesn't authorize it. It is unconstitutional. Why can't you read the words on the page? Though Thomas has said similar things in the past, yes, he has many, many times. His opinion in Sackett is one of the most nihilistic opinions written by any federal judge. No, it's not nihilistic. It's just saying this is what the Constitution says. The federal government's power is limited. It is a government of limited powers, or to put it another way, a government of enumerated powers. The Tenth Amendment confirms this. All powers not given to the federal government are reserved to the states and the people. That means that the Constitution of the United States sets out the powers of the federal government. These are all the powers of the federal government. This is all that there is. Enumerated powers. This is a classically conservative view. This is not new. All right. Justice Thomas wants to take it to perhaps a wide extreme, perhaps wider than I would go in this domain. So Justice Thomas may indeed be wider in this respect than me, I would think. But, you know, the overall thrust of what he's saying is classically conservative. Enumerated powers, reservation of powers to the state, limited federal power, looking at the actual text of the Commerce Clause, trade between states, looking at the actual text of the Second Amendment, right? We might disagree as to some of the scope of this, but Justice Thomas's opinion, even though perhaps he wants to take it further, is not incompatible with overall conservative legal thinking. This is pretty standard. Vox seems to be discovering it for the first time for some reason. Neil Gorsuch, who was appointed to the court, has not revealed just how far he's willing to go in sabotaging the U.S. government. Again, I mean, the, the U.S. government is doing a lot of things that are perhaps unconstitutional, at least in some respects, in this respect. So now there are two justices who are willing to commit judicial arson. Wow. Because they're willing to actually uphold the constitutional text. Again, we could disagree as to how far it goes. Justice Thomas has a tendency to go much further than I would go. And I think further than Gorsuch would go. But the idea that a lot of this stuff the federal government is doing is unconstitutional because it violates the plain text of the Constitution. It's just what the Constitution says. Much of Thomas's opinion is an attack on what he calls New Deal era conceptions of Congress's power under Commerce Clause. That's an accurate description of what it is. It is a New Deal conception of Congress's commerce power. That's just accurate. That's, that's factual. Thomas argues that Congress should return or court should return to a narrow understanding of power to regulate national economy that follows a case called Hammer versus Dagenhart in 1918, an infamous and long overruled decision striking down a law that prohibited good produced by child laborers from being sold in U.S. markets. Well, as it relates to between states, maybe, right? To the extent the goods are transversing state lines, then maybe, maybe that's interstate commerce because it's trade between the states. So if the federal government wants to say, okay, you can't trade between these goods, maybe that is a valid exercise of commerce clause. So maybe this decision, maybe the decision that says you can't trade in these goods because they're produced by child labor, maybe that's constitutional. You know, okay. Thus, and then he would go even further than that. The primary thrust of his opinion is the federal government's authority over channels of interstate commerce, roads, waterways, railroads, and such, is limited only the power to keep them open and free for any obstruction to navigation. Okay, is that correct or not? I don't know. I haven't actually thought about that, to be honest, 
in that domain. So should we get into the channels of interstate commerce? What does it mean to regulate, for example, roads, waterways, railroads, and infrastructure? Is all that it means is to keep them open and free? I mean, one would presume it would allow for uniformity in sort of those things at a bare minimum. So I don't think I would agree, assuming Justice Thomas goes that far. So if Congress wanted to say that, you know, railroads, you know, because they travel interstate, have to be made this way so that they're compatible, that's probably constitutional. If Congress wants to say, you know, the roads have to be this way with signage this way, so because people travel on the roads between the states and therefore uniformity in our signs and and stuff that's probably legal. So, do I agree this far? Probably not as far as Justice Thomas wants to go. But this is his idea. Okay. So he, again, he might want to go further than me. But the underlying idea that if it's wholly within a state, we can't get to, is what the constitutional text says. Taken seriously, this approach could gut much of the rest of the Clean Water Act. I, I don't think that's necessarily true because a lot of rivers are very interstate. And the lakes that feed into them are interstate. So does this completely gut the Clean Water Act? No, I don't think so. I don't see it. And it could allow a company to dump countless toxins into the Mississippi River, so long as the poison did not prevent ships from traveling on their own. No, I don't, I, I don't think it would or should extend that far. The Mississippi River very much travels between states. I think the EPA can regulate the Mississippi River. I think they can go that far. So assuming Justice Thomas thinks that all they can do with respect to the Mississippi River is keep it open, I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't agree with that reading. The river clearly travels between states. You can regulate that. That's fine. And the tributaries that feed into it and they're indistinguishable from it, I think that's fine. So I wouldn't go this far. It's worth emphasizing, of course, only two members of the Supreme Court have signed on to it. There's probably little risk that Thomas and Gorsuch will get their way soon. Although, of course, it's worth emphasizing that Trump got to appoint three Supreme Court justices, so the court's center of gravity could lurch sharply to the right at a very short period of time. Wow. Amazing. Justice Thomas perhaps taking the principle too far, but actually just reading the constitutional text. Wow. But the fact remains that two of the most powerful people in the country, de facto philosopher kings, who serve for life and cannot be removed from office except by impeachment, have so little regard for the people of the United States that would wipe away Many of the foundations are modern society and scoff the consequences. Well, again, the federal government seems to be acting in unconstitutional ways. Not all of it, a lot of it is proper under interstate commerce authority, particularly in the modern era where interstate commerce is, you know, planes and trains and cars and vehicles and all the rest of it. So I, I don't, you know, think that everything the federal government would be wiped away, but there is some of it that is wholly interstate that, yeah, this is a problem, but it would wipe away the foundations. It's just doing what the Constitution says. It's in the text, people. Read it sometime. The Constitution in the text permits Congress to enact laws with respect to commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. That is the text. Congress can regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with Indian tribes. The, the, the Congress of the United States has tried to sweep a lot of shit into this language because commerce kind of goes everywhere and they're like, so our power should go everywhere. This is the primary constitutional provision giving the federal government authority over private businesses. Yes, including its ability to ban discrimination, protect workers from exploitation and protect the environment. Well, yes, that's true. That is correct. That is the dominant text. Correct. You are correct, sir. The question of just how much power Congress should have has historically been a contentious question, in large part because society Americans live in today would be unrecognizable by the people who drafted the Constitution, which at least in part suggests maybe that we have strayed far. So, yeah. In pre-industrial United States, most business took place in local marketplaces that had minimum interaction with economies of other states. Um, debatable. Depends how you look on it, but certainly not the cars, planes, trains of the modern era. But boats were very usable, so I'm not sure how true that is, but okay. A farmer in Iowa would grow grain 
in Iowa, sell to Iowa, and rarely compete with farmers in other states. Probably true. Yes. Certainly, there were merchants who engaged in interstate international trade. Yes. And the Constitution was written to allow it to regulate. Yes. But in early America, there was a meaningful distinction between local and national. Uh, I don't know. I still think there's a meaningful distinction, at least some of the time. Again, in our modern era, this has become a little bit more blended. So I appreciate that. But there still are local businesses that do things locally. So this distinction hasn't completely evaporated. Vox writing that the atomized economy disappeared after we built the railroads. Yeah, yeah, somewhat. Suddenly, the same Iowa farmer's grain would be shipped to Chicago, where it would be intermingled with grain grown on farms. And then it might be sold in New York or Virginia or even somewhere overseas. Okay, well, to the extent that the grain is traveling interstate, then the federal government could probably impose restrictions on it. So it's like, okay, uh, Iowa farmer, if you want to sell your grain or transport your grain, over state lines, it must conform to these standards. I think that Congress can probably do that. So if they wanted to sell it wholly interstate, intrastate within the state and say, no, we're not gonna ship out of state at all, then, you know, okay. If they wanna sell it out of, out of state, you know, they get, a, they get a bigger market, they get the big market, but it comes with conditions. So it's like, what do you want? Do you want the really big market so you can sell your grain everywhere? Or, but that comes with some conditions, or do you not want those conditions? You might have some conditions imposed on you by the state, but do you want our conditions for our big market? So some businesses will take the deal because huge markets, some businesses won't, but that's their choice to make. So, I don't know, that's fine. The history matters because the Commerce Clause only permits Congress's ability to regulate commerce among the states or commerce which concerns more states than one. In pre-industrial America, most businesses concerned only the state, so they're beyond federal government's authority. But in modern industrial economy, there's no such thing as a purely local marketplace. I would disagree. I would disagree. There are, there are local marketplaces. Businesses routinely trade among state lines. That may be true for many businesses, not true for all. And even if one individual only sells their good to local consumers, that merchant must still compete with goods throughout the United States and sell those goods at a price that's competitive in the marketplace. That may well be true, that they have to compete with goods that are being imported into their state. So that may, as a matter of economic reality, impose certain pressures on them because of free trade between the states. So yes, it is true that you know our purely local merchant over here will have to compete with stuff that comes from beyond the state lines, but some people might want to buy stuff that's purely local. Some people like that purely local. And so, you know, they may very well be able to compete. And, you know, to the people who don't care, they don't care. So everyone's happy. You know, let the market decide. That's how we normally do this. The same Commerce Clause the framers drafted in the belief it would give Congress only limited power became a much broader power to regulate virtually any business transaction in the United States. It sure did. It has been read extremely expansively to the point where it doesn't make any sense to my legal mind. Needless to say, this expansion of federal power, an expansion that's entirely consistent with the constitutional tax, bullshit. Bullshit, it's extremely, it's entirely consistent. Bullshit, it's entirely consistent. No, a lot of it is, much of it is, but there's a significant amount that is not. Many businesses will want to trade in trust interstate. They'll want to continue trading interstate and do things interstate and do things, and Congress's power will continue to be quite expansive. But for wholly intrastate activity, you know, not so much. But this power didn't sit well with the industrialists. They didn't want to pay their workers a minimum wage nor stop hiring six-year-olds to work in their cotton mills. Well, first of all, states can regulate that. And the federal government, as always, can bribe states. This is typically what they do, right? So if the federal government can't do it directly, the way the federal government typically solves this problem is with bribes. It's like, hey, state, yes. Have you considered banning the child labor? No. Well, if you do, we will give you money for X, Y, Z. And states go, yay, money. 
So it's the same way that the drinking age is 21. Can the federal government mandate a drinking age of 21? No. The drinking age is 21 in the United States because every single state has passed a law saying it's 21. They don't have to. They don't have to do that. The states could say 18 or any other age that pleases their fancy. It's completely up to them. Why has every single state said 21? Because the government bribed them with the highway funds. Hey, highways are expensive. Would you like to have highways? Yes, we would. Hey, we'll give you some money for the highways if you have a drinking age. And the states went, yay, money. And so, you know, what was true for the drinking age could be true for the child labor laws, one would imagine. Beginning in the late 19th century, the various people have convinced the Supreme Court to impose increasingly the arbitrary limits, they say, on Congress's power. Although more arbitrary was the federal power because it was pretty unmoored from the text. These are the same limits that Thomas and Gorsuch want to bring back. Well, at least some of them, yes, because the constitutional text applies to interstate trade, trade between states. So businesses that operate in multiple states, goods that flow between states, Congress can pass lots of regulations, I'm sure. But the purely local form that does purely local and is purely local market, probably not so much. And if you want to regulate that, Congress, bribe the states. You're pretty good at it. You've been doing it a lot. A high watermark of court's efforts to shield private business was Hammer versus Dragonheart, a 1918 business that struck down a federal ban on child labor. They reached this outcome by defining the word commerce very narrowly. Commerce includes transportation of persons, land, property, as well as purchase, sale, and exchange of commodities, but doesn't include the underlying making of the goods. Which, you know, okay, that makes sense. I, uh, that seems logical. Thus, under Hammer, Congress could regulate the size of railroad cars that shipped goods, and it could regulate actual sales, but it was powerless to enforce the working conditions. It was powerless to ban child labor, except in limited circumstances where children were employed in shipping or sales. Maybe. Yeah, possibly. This decision maybe goes too far in its own reach because we'd have to consider this decision is 1918, right? So, like, in 1918, as Vox itself pointed out, in 1918, there were a lot more local businesses. The, the nature of national trade was not as deep as it is now as it was 100 years ago. Now, there's a lot more, in, a lot more trade, and trade flows a lot more freely. And the world itself has grown a lot smaller as we're starting to import things a lot more from China on a more regular basis, for example. So, in 1918... These kids were probably less interstate than they are now. So under the facts today, the logical decision, logical decision probably wouldn't go as far. So that doesn't necessarily mean the decision was wrong. The decision might be right. But under the facts of today, it wouldn't go that far because obviously the facts change. And the same law as the facts change will have to come out with a different outcome. So in 1918, was this correct decision? Maybe. I don't know. I honestly haven't looked into it you know, in extensive details, not a case I'm well familiar with. But even if it were correct, the decision today would have to come out differently because of the nature of trade. But wholly intrastate commerce to the extent it exists, this would be correct. In the Sackett versus EPA opinion, Justice Thomas wrote in his concurring, the Commerce's clause is tax structure and history all indicate at the time of founding, the term commerce consists of selling, buying, and bartering, as well as transporting. This means this meaning stood in contrast to production activities like mag 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 manufacture, manufacturing and agriculture. So sighing, belling, and bartering, but maybe not manufacturing. I'm not sure necessarily I necessarily agree with that part of Justice Thomas's opinion. He might be right, but maybe not in their Marmon era. Vox here notes that's the exact same argument as that underlying argument that we just discussed from 1918. So you know, okay. And it was a case that doomed a generation of children to hard labor for meager pay, was correctly decided, and limits, rigid limits on federal regulation should be imposed on the nation today. Yeah, because the federal government has exceeded its mandate. There are many reasons why the Supreme Court eventually abandoned the distinction between transportation and sale. 
and the production of goods, but one of them is that it's completely unworkable. Perhaps it is. complete. Perhaps it is an unworkable distinction in the modern era. Perhaps that's true. I don't know. I haven't really thought about that particular aspect very deeply. So maybe at one point that distinction made sense. Maybe now that distinction makes less sense. So, you know, fair enough. If the distinction doesn't make sense anymore, then again, because of the change in facts, we would have to change the legal analysis. So fair. Maybe production should be included as commerce. Okay, that, that might be true. Even if Congress can't forbid a factory from producing goods using child labor, why can't it use its authority over trans and sale of goods to prohibit items being used by children, being sold or transported? I'm not sure that they can't, by the way. I'm not sure that they can't, right? So if Congress can't actually forbid child labor, which I don't know if they can or not, because I haven't really thought about that particular issue very deeply, but even if it can't, it could probably say, yes, you can't sell the goods between states. So that might very well be a valid regulation of interstate commerce. When the goods are traveling between lines, yes, to gain access to the national market, you must agree to these conditions, one of which is not so much with the child labor. So maybe that would be a valid regulation as it relates to the goods that are traveling state lines. The goods that come between state lines can't be produced by child labor. Maybe that's perfectly fine. As the Supreme Court said in 1941, which overruled the Hammer decision, the court's child labor decision cannot be reconciled with the conclusion that the power of Congress under the Commerce Clause is plenary, which is another way of saying absolute, to exclude any article from interstate commerce subject only to specific prohibitions of the Constitution. In other words, Congress is allowed to ban from interstate trade, and that includes any product that's produced by exploitative practices. I think that's probably correct. I think that's probably correct. So I think that that decision is right. If the goods are traveling between the states, Congress has the ability to regulate it. That's probably legally correct. So I think I agree with that decision. Thomas's opinion in Sackett, they say, would produce even stricter limits on federal government's authority over private industry than Hammer did. Thomas would not only restore the distinction between transportation and production, which I'm not sure if I agree with that. I'm not sure if that's possible. I'm not sure if I would say that. I don't know if I agree with that or not. I haven't really thought about it to that level of depth. So I'm not sure if I'd vote that way. But he also claims that Congress's ability over channels of interstate commerce are limited to the power to keep them open and free from obstruction. I'm not sure if I agree with that either, by the way. So Justice Thomas and I may depart slightly on some of these points. Justice Thomas's opinion may be a direct response to Darby's conclusion that Congress may exclude any article from interstate commerce and may use this power to effectively ban goods that are manufactured. After all, Congress's power to regulate transportation is limited power to keep roads, rivers, and railways free. It turns out that Congress would not be able to ban illegally manufactured goods. Yes, that would flow, and I'm not sure it should flow. So I don't know that I agree. If Congress, all they can do is keep the roads, rivers, and railways free from obstruction, and not ban trade in interstate goods, then yes, Congress would not be able to ban trade in interstate goods. But Congress has the ability to regulate trade between the states and presumably can ban goods that would violate its dictates. It uses the, it uses the ability to sell, sell to a national market as an incentive to agree with its rules. So I don't think I agree. Assuming Justice Thomas wants to go this far, I would not go this far, I don't think. In any event, we have now gone pretty deep into theoretical underpinnings that allow the modern-day regulatory state to exist. Yes, we have, but those underpinnings are not so much theoretical as constitutional. They are what the Constitution require. It is the constitutional text. Assuming that we should do things other than the Constitution, we can amend the Constitution, which is hard, but it's what the Constitution says. So we should do what the Constitution says. That would be good. The one important point to understand from this very technical conversation about constitutional law is that decisions like Darby laid out a legal framework that makes it possible for the federal government to regulate private industry. Yes, they did, in a way that violates the Constitution. So is it a little technical? Yes, we're getting deep into the weeds of the Constitution. We're getting so deep into the weeds of the Constitution, they extend to areas of the Constitution that I have not explicitly thought about. I thought about some of these issues, but I haven't thought about the distinction between selling and production. I haven't thought about it really deeply. I'd have to think about it a lot more. 
I'm not sure I agree that there's a distinction. Maybe there was at one point, but maybe not anymore. But it's what the Constitution requires, so let's do that. 